Okay, Richard. Sit down. Okay. I'm gonna go sh sit down and shut up for once. Um, Richard's gonna do his fabulous duplicator for our demo tonight. Um, a couple of years ago, I was visiting with a good friend, fellow wood turner, and I was talking about <coughs> my buffing table. Those of you who know me probably know the buffing table I'm talking about. And we got talking about some of the problems we were having, and he was having a problem because he wanted to make a series of little uh, columns, but he wanted them all the same. And uh, <clears throat> he'd been looking at some copying machines and duplicators, and we were talking about the table, and I was showing him how it was made buffing so much safer, and helped me anyway. And I suddenly realized that I had been thinking about making a a duplicating machine oh. unit before, and the problem I'd had was positioning a table just right on it. And here I had the answer with the little buffing table that I had. Because uh, when you're developing it, you want to be able to adjust it easily. So, that was the start. <coughs> and this is the table that I came up with. A very simple thing, made of wood. And it has on the bottom a key. I'm hoping it's going to fit this machine. And two little feet. So if I sit it down on the floor or somewhere, it's going to rest on these feet. Not, I'm not going to damage the key. The other thing it has is a key. You can see it along here. Oh, look at there. Oh, there you go. So... The other thing that has to happen is this table has to be a known height from the center of your work because you're going to mount your work between centers or in a chuck <coughs> and you want your cutter to be in the center. That's going to be this one. Okay. So it looks like it's in the middle. Um, I have measured all this some time ago and it seemed to be right. And I made this actually for my little delta, which is a small mini lathe like this. And uh, <coughs> it seems they are the same. So the other thing I do is we have to lock the table down. Don't know how successful I'm going to be at that on this machine. Oh yeah, it looks like it'll be okay. Look at you there. Just a nut in here so I can clamp that to the bed. Make it even more <coughs> sturdy. There. So this is really fixed to the bed now. Uh, a lot of copying machines have a flat plate uh, with a profile on it. And you have a stylus that follows the profile. You can have great big ones with hand wheels, you know, that go along and they're spring loaded and everything. But what I wanted was <coughs> something that when I turn a piece and I say, that's it, that's just perfect, that's what I want to make. I want to be able to copy that piece. So it was necessary that this unit be able to copy a piece that's been turned. So in order to do that, I need another set of centers. And that's the purpose of this key here. Putting these on here, and the key, I know that these are aligned because the key in here, the key here, 
These are in line directly over the center of the lathe. So I can put in here centers like these. and adjust them and tighten them up to hold a piece that I've turned between centers. <clears throat> what I'm going to do for this demo is do a chess piece. Some kind of chess piece. Not a black one, <clears throat> but a uh, little chess piece like this. So I have a piece of wood here and I'm going to turn the little chess piece over, little pawn, and I have here a pawn that I turned that I liked. I said, okay, well I'm going to make a master out of that. Now it fits on a piece of three-quarter shaft like this that has a the wood screw through it. So, <laughs> what I do is I'll face off the block I'm going to make it from and I'll drill a three quarter inch hole with a force and a bit in the end here and a small hole in the middle for the wood screw to go in. Turn the wood screw in. I usually you have a rubber dead low hammer at home, but didn't bring it. <laughs> ah, you nodded out of there. Okay, so this block of wood is securely fitted on this little shaft, and this master is by the same means fitted on here. So what I can do in this instance is not do it between centers but rather and because I thought it'd be easier for you to see and easier for the camera Just fixing this to the table, clamping it down. <coughs> and now I can put my master in here. So I know now this is above the center on the lathe. And I put my block of wood that I'm going to turn in here. And this time I did remember to buy a key. And this is another use, Dave, for mm. collets. Mm -hmm. Collet chucks. Very convenient. Okay, so we have the normal lathe underneath that if we turn it on, the piece we're going to turn is here. So now the trick is, we need to have this one over the top of the master here. We have to get the bottom to line up. So if I had a square, I could put it on here like this. And I could pull it against the bottom one. 
there, line the top one up, and then anyway. Oh. Okay. Color code those things, Richard. Yeah, I should do, shouldn't I? <laughs> Don would come along and change the color. That's very threatening. Okay, so I have this one. We know it's above the center on the lathe because when I built this, I was fussy and set up the keys. And it's easier than it, you might think because what I did was once I got the height of this that I needed, I made the base underneath this and this piece was floating around. I had the key on it. And so I just put a bar of steel between these two and used my square to come up and get them directly in line with that shaft and this shaft. And then I screwed it down to the to the boards. So it wasn't so hard to do. Okay, so we got this fixed. Got this fixed, we've got the tailor stock up. Now this is the cutter arrangement. And I wanted something substantial that's solid, isn't wasn't gonna flop around at all. So I believe this is two inches diameter and uh, had a steel plate on the bottom and then it has some plastic stuck on that. I've started messing I'm trying different things. This works pretty good. This is just melamine on the tabletop. I have another one for my bigger lathe that I went awful fussy with and I cut a baking tin up, took the steel which had a Teflon coating on it and glued that to the top. You mean, and it's very slippery. If I touch this, it will slide all the way over and off the other side. But I don't think you need it that slippery. I think this is just about right here. So now the idea is that this is the stylus. This has to be the same shape as your cutter relative to it's going to come up against your part that you're turning and stop it moving forward. So it'll move forward until this stylus stops it. So now what's important is that the stylus and the cutter are in line. Now you could back it off a little bit if you wanted to make this a little bit big. You could put on whatever gap you put here, you'll make this that much larger. But I tend to make it so that it's square and there are <laughs> a real key job this. There are <laughs> more key than that. This key. You ever thought about replacing all those things with uh, thumb screws or something? No, I never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a a flat on the side of here, so when I tighten it up and I put the flat on so that it stays, keeps the, the cutter level. This is uh, along the lines, I guess, of a spindle gouge. Homemade spindle gouge. So I know I want it... Now when I set this up originally, I didn't have the handle on it, of course. And so I set that. Everything was nice and square. Then I put the handle on and locked the handle. So now I can take it out and actually, I don't need this once I set this up because I just bring the handle up against here and it's fixed for that. Okay, any questions at this point? I'll just uh, talk a little bit about how I made the master. As always, I make a sketch of something like this. And I laminate it. And then I print the sketch full size, like one for one. And there's a little one inch square on here. So when I've printed this, I can measure it and see, is it really one for one? And it is. So 
I know my scale of these is correct. Now what I do, the next thing I do is I cut them out as little individual parts. Okay, so for each part I end up with, and this is the king, I end up with a little cutout and I highlight on it the major sort of dimension change places, places I'm going to want to know where they are. And then I turn the part using conventional turning and I'll take a magnet and I'll put this right on the tool rest, just a magnet on it. And then I line the tool rest up with what I'm turning. So I've got my diameters. The diameters I take right off the sheet. I don't measure anything. I take the diameter with a set of calipers right off the sheet. And then I'll come to this, which is up against the wood I'm turning. And I'll use these lines to transfer that diameter to the piece of wood. So I'll go in with a parting tool and make all the major dimensions that I want to have on it. Then all I have to do is blend it together, of course, and you end up with a piece that's been turned. Now when I turn this master here, and I turn the number of them, as you see, uh, I filmed it and I timed it afterwards and it took me 50 minutes to make this, this piece here. Um, and that's really why you need a duplicator. So I wanted to make a chess set which contains how many pieces? Four, eight, thirty-two. Thirty-two pieces. It's thirty-two hours worth of work. Right, roughly. Besides the cutting of the blocks and the what have you. So now if I have a duplicator, it's not going to take me quite that long to do this one. So the beauty for me is that I don't have to measure anything because I've got the stylus that's going to come against the block. And when I'm cutting it, I'm probably going to be here. Am I in your way? No, that's a perfect picture. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it fine. Okay. Well, let's see if we can cut one, shall we? No questions? No. I'll just check that it's still level with the stylus. Got chips underneath it. Yeah. Seems like it wants to come out a little bit more. Normally, if you do this right the first time, you don't have to do it a second time. Okay, it is back a touch. That would just mean it would be a little bit bigger. two things at this point. I'm watching the distance here to know when I'm getting close and I'm watching that I don't run uphill down down here. I'm always trying to cut downhill. And if 
I get the cut around too much this way, that sharp edge is, feeds quite hard. So I, if I come back straight, it doesn't, doesn't feed as, doesn't self-feed as much. Fine, you get to a point where the stylus is up against the master on the top here and it won't feed any more now I'll push against it, it, it stops. Just the bottom one is secured the same way as the top one. I can move this back out of the way and finish the top. Just helps it when you're taking a heavier cup. And I can turn this without even looking at it. Isn't that amazing? That shape is seared into my brain. Now we have a round cutter here and a round stylus. They have to be the same, otherwise you'll get some unusual results. Now, I don't know if anyone timed that, but it wasn't 50 minutes, three minutes. <coughs> Uh, it's still not finished. It's got radiuses where you want sharp corners and stuff. So, um, one way I can fix that is to use one of my little smoothing scrapers and I made another little support. Yeah. <laughs> And you're all familiar with these, I'm sure, by now. And because I know the maker, he made me an extra one so that I can have one for each direction I want to go. Because you, what you want is the burr up when you sharpen these. The last, and I'm, I changed something now. I want to tell you I changed something. These used to be 20 degrees aside, resulting in a 40 degree angle. Well, because I like simplicity and I'm lazy, I sharpen on a little belt sander. And I have the table set on the belt sander to 40 degrees. And I recently learned how confusing that can be to people. I had a young fellow and I was telling him 40 degrees and he, I sharpened his uh, old gouge for him. He took it home and was using it. He bought it back, come back to see me, he was having some problems. And I said, well, I don't think you've got the right angle on the bowl gouge. Oh, yeah, 40 degrees, just what you told me. Oh, okay. But I realized at that point that 40 degrees can mean different things. So I wanted to make it clear. This is 40 degrees. This is just a straight piece of wood. And this top point is 40 degrees. Well, that's what you want on your bowl gouge. I don't know if I'm, I don't think I've got a bowl gouge. You want 40 degrees this way. So when I set my little table, I've got my belt here, and I've got the table here. Actually, it's 50 degrees on the table, not 40, because 40 in from 90 is 
50. But that's where you want the 40, is here. And so I set my table with my belt coming up here now. My tool rest is at 40 degrees. So I want to leave it there as long as I can. I don't want to change it, I don't have to adjust it. Not one of these fancy ones you buy in a store, you know, with nice handles and everything. Mine's got Allen keys, and you know my trouble with Allen keys. <laughs> so I want to leave that table at 40 degrees. So I thought, I wonder what would happen if I just ground this at 40 degrees. They work wonderfully, <laughs> just as well as they did at 20. So now, anybody who got one of these from me previously, if you want to grind it at 40, it will work well too. And I don't have to change my little thing, so. Uh, there's a number of ways of doing this. You could do this on a regular tool rest. This in the collet chuck. You don't need the table here anymore. So if I was making a big batch of these, I'd probably go to this phase first of all, and then put them aside, and then I just set up with a regular tool rest to finish them. <coughs> well, it's kind of convenient to have that above it there. Now there's no limiting factor anymore, we don't have a stylus on the top, you know, it's all hand controlled now. If you wanted to have a stylus and make the stylus this shape and use it in the other thing, you could do. Talking, too little working here. that Jim do you? Hmm? You mean like that? Something like that. Isn't that much nicer? Oh lovely. <laughs> Just lovely.
Oh, you're in line again. Yeah. <laughs> you just love that spot. Man of danger. Yeah. Brush has got a little, the bristles have got a little hard. This is sanding sealer. Who knows what I'm going to put on it next? Two minute pops. No. Nova Silk, yeah. Nova Silk. Oh, you win the prize. It is. <laughs> 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 After the Nova Silk, it will be two minute finish. Okay. Yeah. I found out your black polish I got from in there is really good for finishing up CA glue finishes. Is it? They work great. Yeah. It's all the Well, of course, the CA glue is a plastic yeah. uh, finish. So it's all plastic. Yeah. All finishes. the little tiny ripples out. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? You wouldn't think that would yeah. do that. I will tell you the secret to that one again. There's another secret. When you have an old car, you know, and the headlights get all misty, oh, yeah. it will clean that off. Just a paper towel. And This is a polishing paste. Uh, it, it just polishes the surface, makes it smoother. I would normally have it running a little faster. You didn't want to get anything on your own. That's right, so now we've got past that stage. High speed. Set a pause. Yeah, you're getting good at catching this stuff. <clears throat> I seem to pick up some black somewhere, I don't know where. Oh, for of this field yeah, is some See, I was making, trying different dyeing techniques. Some got on the steel, got on my thing, it's got on the wood. Oh, what a shame. Oh, wow. Antiquing, Richard. Yes, <laughs> this is an old chess set. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
One thing that I didn't think of when I started going down this path was I have a couple of grandchildren. And one of the things I made earlier on was a little uh, hammer, you know, like a, a gavel. I turned the shaft, made a master, and I turned the, the head of the hammer. And my little granddaughter said, Oh, I want one of those. I said, Well, you have to make it. So her and I out in the workshop using this, um, me just making sure her hand didn't come anywhere near the, the collar chuck, she could quite, could quite easily manipulate that and made her own little hammer, which she's twice as proud of because she made it. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Thanks very much. Yeah. He said, there is hope for me. If your granddaughter can do it, maybe I can do it. I'm sure you could have. He's such a support. Yeah. So, <laughs> there it is, duplicated. <laughs> Looks pretty much the same. No. Well, I like to make them individual, you know, they're handmade. And yeah, the black came off the shaft, but I, uh, and of course when you're doing it at home, when it's quiet and that, you know, uh, you concentrate a little more and you're a little more accurate and do things a little nicer. That's it. Thank you. Richard, I noticed in the yeah. other side of your yeah. the guide that you're using, you got to cut narrowers that allow you to use 
narrow order this tools, be awesome. when you, right. like, yeah. instead of that uh, skewer gouge looking piece that you've got in, it's quite broad. And so if you wanted to do very fine things in it, the other ends, oh, it's, uh, <coughs> pardon me. <laughs> oh, this? First yeah, on, your, on this thing here. You yes. see how that's quite broad, Yes. but that's quite sharp. I thought, oh, yes. Was yeah. that set up so that you can use a, a yeah. narrower tool? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever shape tool you want to use, you, you have it. to uh, have a stylus the same shape. And if you're turning acrylics, for example, you need different tools. A flat top gouge works very good for acrylic. Or a double <coughs> sided one, like a skew, but with a round end on it, a round nose skew. And the other thing that I do when I'm home, of course, is I put my dust collector right here, going, you know, the pipe going out the back. And all the chips, and especially with the acrylics, you know what it's like turning acrylics where they wind round everything. <laughs> In fact, you'll notice there's a little slot cut in here. Well, a piece of a plastic butter dish cut and just sort of jammed in there, a little bit of hot melt glue, gives you a curved thing. So when I'm cutting the acrylics, the stream of plastics from the acrylics comes up, hits that straight down the... <clears throat> so you don't end up with it wrapped all around your palm, which is... Really nice. <laughs> I don't have quite as an elaborate cure for that. I keep an old toothbrush, and all you got to do is touch it, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. You always got a better answer, haven't you? No, I didn't say it was better than yours. <laughs> Not as elaborate, anyway. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, uh, yeah. I found that they, when they build up fast, they oh. just wrap right around their tight, and and. Uh, he didn't just you can't fall see off. what you're turning then. No, <laughs> you can't see. Not being able to see isn't such a problem here, even if they do wrap yeah. around. Because you you know where you are here with the master. So you you know, once you reach that you know you're there. Richard, the beeswax finish. Yes. Do you use that uh, generally on a lot of things or that's the first No, I I've started using it more recently. And the thing that brought me back to it was I have a bowl up in my upstairs in my room that I turned with my father 40 years ago, and he kept bees, and he put beeswax on it as a surface finish, and it still looks the same today as it did back when we turned it together. So I thought, why am I not using beeswax? And then I saw a turner online use beeswax. Oh, it was um, Richard Raffin turned a little bowl in about two seconds flat, burned his beeswax in it, rubbed it off with a rag, and beautiful finish. I thought, geez, why aren't I using that? So I've tried it, and it, it does work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would normally buff that, too. I haven't buffed anything here, but while it's on here, it's ideal for you to... Well, for something like a pan, beeswax won't last, right? Yeah. I have no idea. I don't know really. I don't know uh, about that. Because I've even had used like friction polish, it doesn't last on pens at all. Yeah. Skin oils. Mm -hmm. Yep. But so here's a case where I had a pen that I gave to somebody twenty years ago and I saw them a few years back and they still had that same pen and they used it all the time. And I had used uh, carnauba wax on it, right. melted it Carnivus, in, yeah, melted it in, and uh, it was really quite yeah. the same. Because what will happen too is a, a patina will. Yeah, develop. it did. It did develop a yeah, patina. A patina yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, yeah. But like friction polish, I've used that on pens, and then three, four months it's gone. Well, I know you've yeah. told me that before, Yogi, and uh, I've had not had that experience. Um, but, and I did that test, you remember, I brought in where I had rubbed it every day for a month, kept it on the dining room table, and I did a test piece because you told me that. Yeah. My wife thought I'd gone nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? That's a test. <laughs> Richard, can we just blow off the chips off of your end of your tool so that they can see the profile on that? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. I just wanted to. Okay, there. Yeah, just so that people can get a look at what that was like. Do you have any plans on sharing your plans? 
Oh yeah, I can share the plan for this. Really, the table is pretty straightforward. It's a wooden platform, you know, that you have to produce. I, I, I like the key idea and I like the feet idea so I can put it on the shelf, you know, and it doesn't damage the keys. I have plans for all the bits and pieces. This is steel. This is a special piece. It's just for balance. Because otherwise, I'd put them on here and forward. forward. <laughs> uh, when I would be setting it up, I'd put it on, and it would always fall forward. So I'd put a little weight on the back, just so, so I could sit it there. And it wouldn't uh, fall over. So this, this, uh, these pieces are steel. This is wood, MDF. Just a wooden bottom with a wooden key slot in it. So it's all easy to make. I can sell these pieces if somebody doesn't want to make them themselves. When you're setting it up, you need a length of three quarter inch bar stock to go from one to the other so you can lock them together uh, and set them up over the thing to set your key correctly to you know on this before you screw it down I haven't written up a method for doing it but I, I did draw it and I, I've told you before that I use uh, draft site for drafting which was a free drafting program for 2D drafting that was almost identical to AutoCAD and it's been free for years and years. They sent out a notice saying that as of the end of this year it will no longer be free and all the free versions that are out there will cease to run. Mm. So I'm now Cor CorelCAD man. <laughs> Which is a very similar program other than it has 3D abilities as well. You could have just set the time back on your computer every time you want to use it. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, probably someone will come up with a hack, but I don't want to mess with it. Yeah. Richard? Yes? There was one more advantage here you didn't mention. Okay. The three-quarter inch, one-quarter inch deep hole in the bottom. Put your leg slug in that to wait to do bottom weight. Yeah, the, the, it's the size that fits the old cent piece, that, actually. Mm. Like a one cent piece, if you happen to have a sack full of them, you know, a sock full of them, <coughs> holding a door open somewhere. <laughs> They're worth almost a cent a piece. <laughs> you can fit them in there, and then your name, maker's name, little disc, you know, engraved, laser engraved on the top of it. Yeah, that's the I plan. I vision about it, but just like uh, I got a chest set at home with their lead weights in the bottom. Yeah. And that would, this is just ideal for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's part of why I did it that way. No, I forgot to mention it. No. <laughs> part of the plan. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard.